Hello, everyone. Um, we are just going to take about 30 seconds before we start off, um, just so we can get the largest number of people attending. Um, very excited for this panel, but I'm just going to wait a few more seconds to officially start. Okay, well, I believe I've waited my requisite 30 seconds that I identified before. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming everyone to this webinar today. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anna Sanyal. I'm the diversity chair for the ACS Columbus chapter, and I'm also the immediate past president of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association of Central Ohio. Um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone uh, who has joined us today for this topical panel presentation. I know we have people from um, the ACS chapters, from the Asian Pacific Bar Association, we have community members, and people who are generally interested in Japanese American history. So welcome. Um, it is critical for us as a country to learn the lessons from our past and not repeat those mistakes in the future. So I'm excited to hear from our esteemed panelists, Judd Chen and Don Tamaki. Um, as you know, we also have a very esteemed um, moderator. So before I have the pleasure of introducing her, I have some quick housekeeping items. Um, this uh, event has been approved for one hour of California MCLE credit. Um, one hour of Ohio CLE credit is pending for the event. Uh, so for those of you who want the CLE credit, it's critical that you complete the evaluation that we send out after the program. Um, and then we will also, with that evaluation, have some written, written materials uh, about the program that might be of interest to you. Um, and lastly, we are recording this panel. So if you know of people who weren't able to attend, you will also get that email with the recording. So feel free to share widely with your networks. Um, below, there is a Q&A box. So that's where you should be putting in your questions. I will be monitoring them throughout the webinar and then um, interrupting Dahlia respectfully when I can um, to kind of um, hand her off those questions. We'll also have a formal question and answer session at 6, 10 p.m. Uh, if you want to save your questions until then. And then I just also want to let everyone know that for record keeping purposes, we will be tracking participation by monitor monitoring who is signing in and out. And we'll also have three polling questions during uh, the webinar. So don't be surprised when you see that. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this afternoon, Dahlia Lithwick. Dahlia is a senior editor at Slate and in the, that capacity has been writing their Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence columns since 1999. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, The New Republic, and Commentary, among other places. She's host of Amicus, Slate's award-winning bi-weekly podcast about the law and the Supreme Court. In 2018, Dahlia received the American Constitution Society's Progressive Champion Award and the Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis. Dahlia won a 2013 National Magazine Award for her columns on the Affordable Care Act. She's been twice awarded an online journalism award for her legal commentary and was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in October of 2018. Dahlia earned her BA in English from Yale University and her JD from Stanford. Uh, she's currently working on a new book, Lady Justice, for Penguin Press. Dahlia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna, and thanks to everybody who is uh, zooming in. I kind of wish we could be doing this in real time, but I've grown accustomed to the utter weirdness of zooming in from the basement. Um, it is such an honor to moderate this conversation. Uh, I cannot tell you how important it is to think of this not simply as a, a historical conversation, but 
a conversation about something that inflects on every single issue that we are worried about and concerned about today. And so uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our two esteemed panelists with the caveat that I could talk about them for 10 minutes, but we'll be brief. Um, the Honorable Judge Edward M. Chen is District Judge on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California. President Obama nominated Judge Chen to the court on August 7, 2009. He was confirmed 641 short days later after a contentious confirmation process. He is a longtime public interest advocate and was a staff attorney with the ACLU of Northern California, where he served on the Quorum Nobis team for Fred Korematsu, so welcome, Judge. Don Tamaki is managing partner of Minami Tamaki, and among other impactful accomplishments, he served on the legal team that reopened the 1944 Korematsu case we'll be discussing today, overturning Korematsu's criminal conviction for defying the removal of almost 120,000 Japanese Americans. Uh, Don was the 2020 recipient of the ABA Spirit of Excellence Award, and it is just a profound honor to join both of these uh, esteemed gentlemen in conversation. Before we begin, uh, two quick reminders. One is please, uh, as Anna just said, put your questions in the Q&A and not the chat, and that will make it easier to wrangle. So that little thing at the bottom that says Q&A, that's where you should be putting your questions. And we're assuming that most of you hopefully saw the film, uh, which is extraordinary. But in the event that some of you haven't, we have just a brief six minute clip uh, of Don talking about it. So Vincent, if you would roll it now, we'll take a minute to at least get on the same page. My stepfather got out of law school really in the depths of the depression, clerked for a federal judge, and went into the Justice Department. And this was a time, of course, of the Roosevelt administration. And many of the very, very bright and able young people who went into the Justice Department were very much motivated by the ideals of the New Deal. I was in my office on Sunday, December 7, 41, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and got all of the officials to come into the department that night where uh, I drafted uh, the orders for the NN control unit of the department. When I first saw DeWitt early in December, I don't think it ever occurred to him that he would be allowed to give a military order which would say that all the states of California and Oregon and Washington were uh, barred to American citizens of Japanese ancestry as well as aliens. He wanted the civilian authorities, the Department of Justice, to intern more Japanese aliens than we were interning. It was our view that really a minimum program was required. The Attorney General and I and the Department of Justice uh, believe there was no factual basis for moving against Americans of Japanese ancestry. This was very largely a movement to, by a lot of different people to, get the ja to use an opportunity to get the Japanese farmers off the West Coast. Edward Ennis was in charge of preparing the government's brief to the Supreme Court when the Korematsu case came before it. Well, Ennis is looking to confirm and incorporate the facts of DeWitt, that Japanese Americans were engaging in espionage and sabotage. And so he begins to call up these reports thinking that he's going to incorporate this evidence within the government's brief. And in searching for the evidence, he finds the opposite that there is no evidence. Among the documents he found was the Office of Naval Intelligence report. They not only say that Japanese Americans pose no danger, but it actually recommends against this rounding up that happened. He writes to the Solicitor General of the United States, a guy by the name of Charles Fahey. The Solicitor General 
is the nation's chief representative to the United States Supreme Court. The Solicitor General speaks not just for the President, but also for the Congress of the United States. And Anna says, it occurs to me that if we don't disclose the contents of the Navy report to the court, that we are engaging in the suppression of evidence. Ennis writes to the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, and basically says, what about these reports by DeWitt of illicit signaling by Japanese Americans? And J. Edgar Hoover writes back, we've investigated every single claim of shorter ship radio transmissions, and we could find no evidence on which prosecution would lie. Ennis got in touch with James Lawrence Fly, who was the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. He prepared reports, which they sent to Ennis, which concluded that there was no substance to any charge that Japanese Americans had committed acts of espionage or sabotage. We had that investigated by both the Federal Bureau of Investigation and by the Federal Communications Commission. And we got reports that there was no uh, uh, records, and their records were complete, of any such uh, signaling. Ennis enlists the help of a fellow Justice Department lawyer by the name of John Burling. When the final draft of the government's brief to the Supreme Court in the Korematsu case was being prepared, John Burling decided to insert a footnote. It was a cautionary footnote that said, we are in possession of information that contradicts General DeWitt's final report, particularly as it involves the commission of acts of espionage and sabotage by Japanese Americans. In this case, the stakes and the consequences were so high. By this time, almost 120,000 Americans had already been deprived of their freedom. They were imprisoned. The Supreme Court briefs are printed in booklets. The brief is actually goes to the printing press. John J. McCloy found out about the footnote. He contacted Solicitor General Charles Fahey, and Fahey ordered the printing presses stopped. The original footnote that John Burling drafted was deleted. At the oral argument, the Solicitor General absolutely stood behind General DeWitt's report. So this attempt to alert the Supreme Court that this roundup, this mass incarceration, really rested upon a foundation of intentional falsehoods failed. And that case stood for 40 years. Okay, so, so Don, let's start with you. And, and I guess I would say one of the things that's hard to wrap your head around is that this is, we are going to have a conversation about a sort of fraud within a sin, right? So the sin is Korematsu and all uh, that it stood for. And then there was a real-time fraud upon the court that I think is less well-known to people uh, that contributed to the sin, but in and of itself, I think, raises really awful questions about how we think about race and also how we think about truth in the judicial process. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind just setting the table. Uh, tell us a little bit about Korematsu and the internment cases and what animated them, and then maybe we can back into this sort of real-time fraud upon the court. Sure. So <clears throat> I think I should say first that we, we are living in historic times. I mean, it's terrific that with this webinar examining Korematsu versus the United States, it's through the lens of the Japanese American experience when they were imprisoned for no other reason than they happened to look like the enemy. 
but it reflects a, a culture of prejudice. And uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, although it stems, it was triggered by the torture, murder of George Floyd, which shined a light on so many other um, uh, issues and uh, uh, killings of, of uh, black young men at the hands of police. Um, it really, that movement ultimately shines a light on this issue of systemic prejudice. And we're watching the beginning of a, a new civil rights movement, I think, that we haven't seen in 50 years. Um, the experience of Japanese Americans, and particularly Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Min Yasui, who challenged this mass roundup, is another example of this systemic prejudice that is part of United States uh, history. Uh, when uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in uh, December 7th, 1941, uh, within a couple days, the Secret Service and the FBI swept into Japanese American communities all along the West Coast. Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, et cetera, and uh, began rounding up those who were uh, Japanese school teachers or martial arts instructors or uh, Buddhist priests and so on. And that was soon followed by the signing by the president of an executive order 9066, which authorized uh, the entire West Coast to be put under the direction of a military general, in this case, John L. DeWitt. And DeWitt began to spin out uh, uh, conspiracy theories about Japanese Americans. He said that Japanese Americans belong to an enemy race. And that was the conspiracy theory then. It does reflect um, sort of a time-worn playbook that has been in existence in the country. I think that's part of the Black Lives Matter movement to shine a light on that which consists of basically three parts. I mean, one, appeal to prejudice. Secondly, engage in fear mongering and scapegoating. And three, um, conspiracy theories, uh, alternative facts and falsehoods uh, in order to uh, achieve a political agenda. So uh, by March of 1942, um, uh, the roundup began, first began by curfew. Uh, Japanese Americans could not go out of their homes after, uh, uh, before six in the morning. They had to be in their homes by eight at night. And uh, within a month or two, uh, orders to report to makeshift assembly centers, these temporary prison camps. And ultimately, uh, they were sent to um, more permanent uh, American style concentration camps from California to Arkansas. Three people uh, challenged these orders. Uh, they didn't know each other at the time. They're all American-born citizens. Uh, Fred Kormatsu, who came from the Bay Area, Gordon Hirabayashi, who was a student at the University of Washington, and Min Yasui, that was a new, who was a newly minted uh, lawyer uh, from Portland, Oregon. And each challenged uh, the internment on the grounds that they were American citizens. This was unconstitutional. There was no trial. There was no evidence. And uh, the government defended against these cases by first claiming that Japanese Americans were engaging in espionage and sabotage. And the second reason was they claimed that they were so different ethnically uh, and culturally that they couldn't possibly be an American. They were prone to disloyalty was the term. And um, to their surprise in the series of cases in 1943 and 44, they lost. And those cases stood for the next 37 years until quite by accident, uh, researchers, you saw one of them, Peter Irons, uh, researching the government archives, could not find Fred Korematsu's uh, Justice Department file. Uh, Peter wanted to write a book on, on th these events. And he traced them to the Department of Commerce. The, these cases had been misfiled in the Commerce Department. And um, not knowing what he'd find, opening boxes that had been sealed for 40 years, among the top of the uh, uh, memos that he found were Justice Department memos written by Edward Ennis, who you saw in the introduction, who was responsible for supervising the drafting of the Korematsu pre defending the program. And so when he began to call up the reports from the FBI, the Federal Communications Commission, and the Navy, to his shock and alarm, he found that each of them said there was no reason to lock these people up. They were not engaging in espionage and sabotage and characterized the Army's claims that Japanese Americans uh, were spying as, quote, intentional falsehood. And on that basis, uh, 
these cases uh, were reopened. Um, before we turn it over to uh, Judge Shan to talk about this, I, I would say um, one, of the, one of the consequences of the Korematsu case was that um, it, it, it repeated a pattern that when the president and the, the executive branch invokes national security, um, the court, instead of asking questions and holding the uh, government to account as a co-equal third branch uh, of government, basically said, if the government tells us that this rounding up and imprisoning people makes a nation safe, safer, then who are we to question the government? And of course, we knew uh, that, that after all these years, that that was a civil liberties disaster. Uh, what we're finding now is we're in danger, and we are um, in danger, and we are repeating the same uh, uh, pattern all over again. Uh, Trump versus Hawaii and some of the other cases that have gone up, especially those involving people of color, the separation of parents from their children, um, the targeting of Muslims and other uh, refugees, uh, and so on. And again, it seems to have been that this, this playbook involving um, uh, appeals to prejudice, scapegoating and fear mongering and trafficking in these uh, conspiracy theories. So that's a general framing of these cases. Thank you so much. I, I want to turn it over to you, Judge Chan, to talk about sort of the doctrine that is left behind, but also I, I think Don tees up what is I think the essential question, which is what does it mean when the imprimatur of the court is, you know, th this would have been bad enough, but the court blessed it. And the court also, I think, blessed this very troubling proposition that Don references, which is, you know, oh, it's too hard for judges to figure this out and pierce whatever the facts are. So it, it is the duty of the court to stand down as soon as national emergency is cited. And I, I guess I'd just like you as a judge to tell me how you think about that with regard to how you think about your job. Well, you know, uh, ever since one goes to grade school and learns basic civics lesson, you think that the court is the one place you go to search for the truth. That is a basic function of our judicial system, is to search for the truth, and, and, and that is essential. And in that search for the truth, we've set up an adversary system where facts are supposed to come out. Uh, we've imposed duty upon the government to reveal facts in a criminal prosecution that may be helpful to the defense, doesn't matter of due process. But the whole system is built upon um, truth seeking. And when that system is, is subverted, uh, it, it really tends to undermine you know, the process. And one would think that the courts would be very jealous and safeguarding that very function. Uh, but that's one of the astounding things when you look back and you read, reread the Korematsu and the Hirabayashi cases, you look through and you look for evidence, any discussion of evidence, you know, most decisions, you talk about the evidence. When we have a trial, we have uh, findings of fact, you know, lengthy documents, but you don't see a single word, not a single piece of evidence of any kind of sabotage or threat throughout that. Instead, you find words like the court cannot reject as unfounded the judgment of the military authorities and of Congress. Cannot reject as unfounded. We cannot say that the war making branches of the government did not have ground for believing. That's saying as long as there's some possible foundation, some ground for believing, it doesn't matter what the facts are. And, and, and that is troubling enough in terms of you know, one would think would be the basic role of the courts, but when that's applied to uphold a law that discriminates against a vulnerable, discreet, religious, or racial minority, then it's all the more insidious. Because as the court held in a famous footnote called uh, Caroline Products, uh, just six years before Korematsu, um, the court said that, well, when you have a law that discriminates against particular groups, we should apply what's called heightened scrutiny, closer scrutiny, protect, quote, discrete and insular minorities who cannot defend themselves in the normal political process. 
And that is from a larger perspective, the role of the court, not just truth finding, but it does have a protective role for individual liberties and rights, particularly of groups who are vulnerable and not well represented in the, in the normal political process. And that's the double whammy here. You not only have sort of turning a blind eye to the facts, but in the context of this enormous act of uprooting 120,000 Japanese American citizens, two thirds of whom were citizens, and, and saying, well, even with our special role, we're going to disregard that. Um, and, and it's somewhat ironic because in, just, in Korematsu, Justice Black starts off by saying, quote, all legal restrictions which curtail the civil rights of a single racial group are immediately suspect and must be subject to the most rigid scrutiny. And that is, for those of you who are lawyers and studied law, you know that that's the origin of the strict scrutiny tests applied to racial classifications that ultimately led to Brown versus Board of Education and, and Loving and many other cases. And yet in that very case, he concludes, rather than applying rigid scrutiny, he says, we cannot say that the facts and circumstances could afford no ground for differentiating citizens of Japanese of, of Japanese ancestry from other groups in the US like German and Italian Americans who were not subject to the same kind of mass roundup. And so it is a complete default uh, by the court. And as Justice Jackson put it in his dissent, the sin was bad enough, the rounding up, but the validation by the court is, is even more dangerous. And he says, uh, once you validate the principle of race discrimination like, like the court did, then it lies there like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Those are prescient words, it seems to me, and I guess we'll talk about some of the more recent cases, but that's the legacy of those two cases. Thank you, Judge. I guess that is the place I wanna pick up on because of course, undergirding this entire conversation is just shocking, horrifying racism. And, I think it's very fashionable to say, oh, that was different. It was the 1940s where, you know, colorblind and race blind and everything's great. And of course, we know that's not true. And I want to talk about the racism that animated the travel ban. But I also, I think this question is for you, Don, but I, I'm really struck by, you know, even if you only saw that six minute clip, we know that the DeWitt memo gets destroyed because it's super, super racist. But nonetheless, what is allowed to stand and be argued at the court is also racist enough, I guess. Just there is this really troubling fault line through this film and through this conversation about how racist can we get away with being and still have the court be okay with it. And I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about both, you know, the, the racism that is under the surface in the Korematsu decision, but also the racism that really is motivating the travel ban and some of what we're seeing today. I think ultimately then as now, this is an effort to define who is an American and who is not, who belongs here and who doesn't. And uh, the part of the the troubling part of that defining process of our culture is, is that it seemed as perfectly normal. I mean, <clears throat> that the number of uh, uh, police uh, uh, deaths at the hands of uh, police that the Black Lives Matter movement has, has uh, shined a light on um, until the George Floyd uh, incident barely would evoke a shrug because it's kind of normal. I mean, when you can separate people at the border, um, separate children from their families, bar barely a shrug. Um, when the President of the United States uh, refers to Mexicans as drug dealers and rapists, um, you know, barely a shrug. And uh, the reason why the Korematsu case, regrettably, is probably more relevant today than when we reopened this case in the 1980s is because this playbook is sort of repeating, repeating itself. Um, what does that culture racism mean? Well, you know, <clears throat> the night the uh, roundup began in 1942, but by the time these cases, uh, Gordon Hirabayashi, Minori Sui, and Fred Korematsu's case 
reached the Supreme Court, it was a couple of three years later, 1943 and 44. And by then, almost 120,000 people had lost their freedom, their property, some had lost their lives. They died in those camps. And so um, uh, the issue was, was this legal or not? Was this constitutional or, or not? Can you lock people up without evidence, without trial, without any showing of any wrongdoing? And so the Department of Justice had a big problem. You know, how do you prove uh, the validity of this and uphold it when there's no evidence of wrongdoing? And, you know, um, these are highly educated people, Stanford, Harvard, educated lawyers. Uh, and um, when Edward Ennis, a whistleblower, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. and, and charged with the responsibility of arguing to uphold this program, found the opposite. You know, F. J. Edgar Hoover wrote back and he said, every uh, every claim that the Army's making of shorter ship uh, transmissions are false. Um, the Federal Communications Commission wrote back and said, General DeWitt's men are picking up radio signals emanating from Tokyo and calling them shorter ship transmissions. They can barely read 10 words a minute. And uh, these, these privates pass this information on to the general and he believes it, quote, it's pathetic to say the least. I mean, it was very, and there's a memo going back and forth saying, it occurs to us that if we don't uh, disclose the contents of these uh, evidence to the US Supreme Court, it amounts to suppression of evidence. And um, another memo from Meta said to the Assistant Attorney General, it is highly unfair to this racial minority that these lies be put forth uh, by the army and be un unchecked. And all of that went to the so Solicitor General. And knowing the, the reports, knowing uh, that there was no evidence, um, basically uh, advanced before the Supreme Court the same false narrative, knowing them to be untrue, knowing it to be untrue. So <clears throat> I think what the lesson is, Dali, on this is when the culture of prejudice is so strong, when it pervades everything, uh, when the courts are, are uh, looking the other way, they turn a blind eye, as Judge Chen said. What that means is uh, the temptation of people in charge to twist those facts, to fabricate evidence, that temptation becomes almost irresistible. And, uh, and then <clears throat> what you know as democracy does no longer exist. And this is how democracy fails and dictatorships rise to power. So although the Japanese American story certainly involves Asian Americans, it's really a, an American story and a, a cautionary one. And um, the fact that uh, if the culture of prejudice is that strong and no one's questioning it, the courts don't do their job to find out, you know, is this really motivated by a need to protect the nation or is this the fulfillment of a racist campaign promise, for example. Now, once that is uh, the prevailing value, then, um, the facts in the Constitution, the law simply doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what I'm concerned about, and maybe Judge Shen can talk about this in some of the other cases, about what the danger and the risk might be going forward. Um, Judge Chen, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. And also, I think, to think a little bit with us about something I know you think so hard about, which is how judges can get beyond the biases that are built into the system, that there is so much that is baked into the machinery of justice uh, that really, I think, you know, we purport to be blind and yet there's so much about the machinery that is freighted by race. Um, so I, I'd love you to sort of answer both sort of follow up on what Don said and, and then just think with us a little bit about how much systemic racism has inflected on this justice system we like to pretend is long over what happened in Korematsu. Well, for some time now that the, the courts have um, uh, sort of sponsored our own, our own training of judges to look at issues such as implicit bias. And, um, and, and when you do that, if you do a meaningful exercise, you, you, you should do a self-examination and look at the assumptions you make one, when you're making decisions. And really a good illustration of that is the Hirabayashi case. Uh, what Don said, this, this assumption that Japanese Americans were more prone to disloyalty than other groups 
if you, I, I urge people to actually read. It's very, it's very interesting because the court talks about how Japanese Americans do not assimilate like other people into American society, uh, that they tend to congregate and, and intensify their solidarity with themselves, and that a large number of parents send their kids to Japanese language schools, for, for heaven's sake. I mean, it, it, it goes through all this stuff. <laughs> Ironically, even talks about the history of discrimination against Japanese, which then hardened their own isolation, supposedly. So this was an assumption that was actually articulated by the justices. Um, you know, one wonders if someone of Japanese American descent were on that court, maybe there could have been a balance and say, wait a minute, that's, that's not true. So having to examine your own assumptions and, and, and internal justifications of which you might not even be aware of, I think is critical. And, and I think it's sort of illustrative in, in, in that case in Harabashi where that assumption was made explicit for all to see. You know, the other thing that struck me, uh, that strikes me is, we talk about Black Lives Matter. Well, and that, that, I think that articulates a deeper problem. We don't tend to value all things equally. I mean, long before uh, the killing of, of, of George Floyd, uh, you, you had, you know, the McCleskey case um, out of Georgia, where it was shown to the Supreme Court that all other things being equal, taking into account some 36 variables, that if you kill a white person, you are three to four times more likely to be put to death than when you kill a black person. Same kind of crime, same criminal history, everything else held the same. Um, and, and you see that actually a little bit in this case, uh, in the Korematsu case as well, because Justice Black in the end says, well, you know, uh, hardships are part of war, War is an aggregation of hardships. All citizens, both in and out of uniform, feel the impact of war to greater or lesser measure. As if Japanese American lives don't matter. It, it, total non-recognition of the impact. And so that's the other thing that courts need to be aware of is the impact and the consequences and is it differentially felt? And I, I you know, that, that is certainly was not evident in the Kormatsu case. And, and, and just to loop back to what you said, um, at first, Judge, I think it's so important to understand that the courts do have this independent countervailing responsibility to protect those lives that are not protected by the other sort of wealthy, powerful arms of the political process. So that, that can't be sort of wiped off the, the ledger. Uh, it's, it's actually the only branch that has that affirmative duty. I wonder if um, Vincent's got a, a, a little brief video um, just about sort of the, the intersection of the moment we're talking about Korematsu travel ban to this moment we're in of hopefully tilting toward racial justice in the Black Lives Matter. So maybe uh, we can look at that for a second. We cannot walk alone. We must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We want justice for black families. Because they marched, America became more free and more fair. Not just for African Americans, but for women and Latinos, Asians and Native Americans. America changed for you and for me. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So um, I'm going to ask folks to put their um, questions in the Q&A. And, and um, before we take questions, I think I want to 
ask both of uh, the panelists to react to what we just saw and to do this very hard work of fusing together something that happened in the 1940s, um, as Don notes, with the express complicity and duplicity of you know, the War Department, the Justice Department, the Solicitor General. Uh, the government was not neutral in this. The government effectuated um, what we are sort of describing as uh, this, this deep altering of facts. And I wonder if you can marry that to this moment we are seeing right now where people are on the streets. They feel as though they are not seen, they are not heard, that the lessons of Korematsu and the travel ban have not been learned. And I wonder if you could both just in a brief minute reflect on looking back at what you know about what we've just talked about, what do you tell people who say this country is exactly the same as it was uh, in 1940 and that uh, the fix is in and there can never be racial justice? Don, why don't we start with you? I know it's not a one minute answer. That was completely ridiculous, but <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you could do it in two so we could well, take One it. of the things that the video uh, shows is that we, we owe a great that to the Black Civil Rights Movement. I mean, it really changed. It opened, in terms of my family's life and what my, par my parents and grandparents went through, completely different. And um, due to the, the changes that were made, I'm talking about Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, most Asian Americans came in post-1965 as a result of immigration reform that eliminated race-based quotas and instead uh, put in family reunification as being the main criteria. And without that, uh, they would not, we would not be here. Uh, refugees, for instance, uh, uh, Southeast Asians, Laotian, Cambodian Americans, we've got big populations that have been um, uh, into this country as part of this whole uh, uh, historical effort continuum about uh, defining what America stands for. So I think that's, that's one thing to, to say that times have changed, but I think what it also reflects, whether it's George Floyd or Fred Korematsu, it's symptomatic of a bigger cultural issue. And that is, if the values say lock them up and that's okay, then people will get locked up. You know, I don't care what the law says, basically. And, and uh, uh, Korematsu uh, demonstrated that. And I think you don't have to convince certain people, you certainly don't have to convince Japanese Americans that, um, uh, that this playbook of, um, of, of appealing to prejudice, uh, fear mongering, and, and the problem with this effort, I this whole movement uh, culture is that it creates its own narrative. You know, when there's a moral equivalency between uh, Nazi uh, marchers in uh, Charlottesville, North Carolina, and the people protesting them, you know, when um, dissenters and whistleblowers can be shouted down and retaliated against, when the press can be portrayed as enemy of the people, um, you know, those, those are symptomatic of a bigger cultural problem, but when taken together, if, if they continue unabated and unchecked, you don't have a democracy anymore. I mean, we will not recognize our country. So I think, uh, I think that's sort of the, uh, the lesson of Korematsu, but it's also the lesson as we watch contemporary events unfold. Judge Chen? Yeah, let me make two points. One is the debate about the role of the courts um, in, in ferreting out the discrimination in where there's national security issues and, and that sort of thing at stake is an ongoing debate. Uh, all you have to do is look at uh, Chief Justice Roberts' majority decision in Trump versus Hawaii and Justice Sotomayor's dissent. And you will see that debate uh, laid out very plainly. Uh, I, I will say that at the same time that uh, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts expressly overturned Korematsu after, you know, 60 years or almost 50, 60 years, um, time, you know, certainly time that was, uh, it was due. Uh, nonetheless, uh, interestingly, the decision in upholding the travel ban applies rational basis review of, uh, even in the face of very strong evidence 
of uh, uh, a band motivated by anti-Muslim uh, animus. And if you look at the, some of the, the, uh, the, the, the formulation of the test in that case, it's very reminiscent of Korematsu. It says, as long as there is a plausibly related, uh, as long as the policy is plausibly related to the government's stated objective, as long as it could be reasonably understood to be based on un unconstitutional grounds, it's okay, even if it was in part motivated by animus. That, that is the language of, of deference, and as uh, Justice Sotomayor puts out, points out, although uh, the court uh, overturned Korematsu technically, uh, it seems to be, at least in her view, making many of the same errors. So that, that debate about judicial review, particularly when you're talking about issues of immigration, natural security, et cetera, et cetera, in the face of classifications against race groups, that is still an open question and it's still being debated. So how far we've come, I mean, I'll leave it to, to history to, to make that judgment. Finally, the, the last point about where we've come, um, you know, there's another quote that I like from, to, to, that I, I go to a lot from Dr. King, and that is injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. <clears throat> and Don mentioned the 1965 Immigration Act that completely reformed immigration and allowed uh, uh, non-race-based immigration and really changed the demographics of this country. Well, that was part really flow from the Civil Rights Act. It flowed right after the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Had it not been for Dr. King, uh, had it not been for the Civil Rights Movement, we wouldn't have had that 65 Civil Rights Act. So our rights are, are deeply interrelated in many ways. I'm so glad you said that because I think it's easy to tell these stories in silos and these are not siloed stories. They are in a profound way deeply American stories that cross uh, ethnicities and religion and races. I I'm going to turn us over to Anna who's going to wrangle the Q&A um, and, and just uh, tell uh, the two panelists for my part, uh, thank you so much. I, I really learned a ton. Thanks, Dahlia. And um, before I begin with the questions, I just want to echo what Judge Chen said. Um, I know I've been thinking a lot about my South Asian privilege uh, during um, the BLM movement. And, you know, I want to recognize that my own community has not always been in solidarity uh, with the Black community. And, you know, we would not, my, my parents would not be here in this country without the civil rights activists. So I think it's just uh, really important that other people of color also come together um, for our black brothers and sisters. Um, that being said, the first, um, the first question is actually a comment. Judge Chen mentioned the McCleskey case, which is the death penalty case. And um, someone, I, I, I have the Carly Edelstein uh, found the citation. It's 481 US 279 for those who want to look it up. Um, so our first question is from Nancy Jack, and Nancy wants to know how we can get mainstream media to cover the Korematsu case um, and the Alternative Facts movie as a reminder to all Americans what can happen when the government lies and covers up truths such as the current administration. Many younger people aren't so familiar with the case and might not see the danger when the president lies and covers up. Don? <laughs> oh, well, uh, you're speaking of what kind of information is out there. The Stop Repeating History campaign that we are a part of have lots of, of uh, material. I'm talking about um, one minute videos, six minute videos, uh, documentaries like Alternative Facts that the um, uh, uh, e this event has provided links for be available uh, through Tuesday of next week. And um, you know you can certainly contact us, and we would love to to provide information. And particularly if if people are interested in doing their own film showings, uh, or their own getting their own information out to their circles or religious uh, um, organizations or any any educational groups that they're a part of, we would love to assist in doing that. 
And Don, I just want to make sure to clarify, I think Nancy wants to know how can we get the mainstream media like CNN and MSNBC more involved. And then I also want to attest to the fact that Don will do whatever it takes to get this movie to your community because I bugged him about it and it just, it happened, so. Well, um, how do you get a track of the mainstream media? When we did the Korematsu case, it was wall-to-wall -wall coverage from every network, every national publication did cover it. After that, it's just a matter of, of uh, what happens in local communities. I would say that um, in some ways, all politics is local. So to the extent that uh, groups are organized at the local level and it becomes a movement and an effort, it will be covered nationally. You know, Dahlia, I think maybe is a better expert in, in knowing how to attract national media than, than I do. But for example, uh, that Edward Ennis piece, uh, that was all clipped from Ed Bradley's 60 Minutes uh, interview of him. And uh, that would not have come to his attention, but for um, local efforts and efforts of uh, researchers to uncover this, this information. So um, if it's compelling enough, uh, you can get the news media to cover it. That's been our experience. Dahlia, did you have anything? I would just add, I think in one sense, you saw briefly in the clip, Neil Cadiel, who was the acting uh, uh, solicitor general, spoke really passionately about this. And in his oral arguments in the travel ban cases, he always kind of ended uh, on Korematsu. I, I think he has been, he's taken it very much to heart that the SG's office was involved in, I think what he would say is a, just a galactic act of, of cowardice. And um, he's really worked very, very hard, I think, to kind of sort of say, this is not in the past, this is still happening. And I think it really requires uh, I mean, I can't answer the question of, you know, what do we do with the news as a blender and everything's like a banana, you know, you just can't um, get any uh, media to cover anything because everything is happening. But I, I will say, I think it's very, very important, um, this act of shaming, you know, and, and making it clear that the Justice Department was a part of this and that the War Department was a part of this. And this wasn't, oh, you know, uh, an aberrant, um, decision from the 1940s, but that institutions, as Judge Chen said, that are pledged to tell the truth and to find the truth, uh, really colluded to obscure the truth. And so I think making sure that high level officials still have to answer for it is, is a piece of making it relevant today, because as everyone on this panel has said time and again, this was not a one off. Thank you. Uh, next question, does Youngstown 2 place any restrictions on the executive's national security powers? Yeah, is, that, is that a legal question? Um, <laughs> Youngstown 2, I can tell this is a uh, con law student or somebody. You know, Youngstown 2 is about the seizure of the, the uh, steel mills, as I recall. And, and the, the basic principle there is that when the, when the executive acts alone, uh, the power is not as, as uh, transcendent as when the executive acts with coordinated branch of government, i.e. Congress. And um, so here, at least in the Korematsu case, you had congressional, it was a public law, it was at 502, um, I don't know if I got the number right, but laid the framework to then, uh, yeah, 504, and then laid the framework for President Roosevelt to sign the executive order. And so um, I, you know, that, and that is another debated question because a lot of what we're seeing now is done by executive order, by proclamation. Sometimes it's alleged to be in conflict with what Congress said, and that's what the, the court had to do when it went through uh, the, the uh, travel ban. It had to go through and look at the statutory provisions to see whether what the uh, administration had done was consistent with an anti-discrimination statute that Congress had passed. And it weaved its way through that and found that it was consistent and that the, another act of Congress gave discretion to the president. So uh, Youngstown still, still, it is true. I, I think that principle still probably stands that when there is congressional authorization, and that's why often there's a debate about whether what the executive does is consistent or actually authorized by an act of Congress. 
Um, and that's why you see a lot of statutory uh, causes of actions too, when there, uh, there are challenges to, to executive orders that are being as inconsistent with some statutory law. So that, that, that keeps playing out. And sometimes it's constitutional, sometimes it's statutory, sometimes it's both. Thanks, Judge Chen. Um, there's a question over here that I'll take really quickly. Um, for fo folks in Ohio, specifically Columbus, are there ways we can get involved in supporting the BLM movement? Um, so I, you know, the poll kind of indicated that many of you are lawyers. There is a critical need for legal observers in Columbus. We are continuing to have protests um, that are well advertised and very well planned in the city. Um, I have been legal observing. Um, it is important to do that and to observe and stand in solid solidarity that way. Um, the National Lawyers Guild is the primary um, organization that trains legal observers. So if you just Google National Lawyers Guild Ohio, you should be able to get their uh, Ohio webpage and uh, Twitter and Facebook. And then if you have, um, so that is, that is probably the most critical need um, right now. If you have uh, further um, um, questions, you can actually email me directly. It's annasanyal at gmail.com. Um, next question, um, if we as law students want to explore paths where we can have a positive impact for communities of color, are there specific careers to explore? Are clerkships helpful? Well, I'll answer that last question. <laughs> clerkships are very helpful, no matter what you do. Uh, uh, and I'm sure some of you have gotten this pitch, but for those of you who haven't, um, Clerkship, if you can, if you can, um, are able to do one of those. Number one gives you insight into how the system works, how judges decide things, what it looks like from the other side of the bench, and in the end, helps you be a much better lawyer. I think it gives you experience in writing, um, and reading, and arguing, and you see a lot of examples of good and bad lawyering, and you come away even with just one year experience with a lot of depth. Um, Two, it, it also provides a network. Um, you know, obviously you, you get to know the judge that you work for, you'll probably know other judges, you'll know other clerks. And, you know, unfortunately that's the way things work in this world. A lot of it is who you know. And if you are hooked up uh, with, with people at some point, um, whether you, you find yourselves aligned with them on some issue or whether you use their resources or, or you know, uh, open up opportunities for you or for them, vice versa, you know, it, it, it's really important. And then finally, you know, clerks have an influence. I, I, you know, I, it's no secret. Uh, you know, judges make the final decisions. We have to decide things based on our understanding of the law, but clerks have uh, a, a degree of influence on the way we see things, the way we understand things. And so to the extent that you can contribute directly to justice uh, right out of law school or shortly out of law school, it's a rare opportunity to do so. And so my answer is yes on that front. Can I add a little bit on that? <clears throat> the, uh, no matter where you end up, you know, <clears throat> a law clerk, one thing, you know, certainly is one way. Being in litigation, I mean, Dahlia's attorney that uh, turned to journalism. Um, there are, are lawyers that gone into government, workers comp, uh, plaintiffs and defense uh, litigators, corporate, whatever. Um, find a way to contribute, a big or small. And um, I'll just say something is probably the oldest guy on this panel, that um, we're watching something that is, it's, it's definitely in a historic time right now. Um, the cultural norms are being challenged. Uh, you know, there's a confluence of historic events as it is, even before the George Floyd uh, killing with uh, COVID-19 got everybody shut in. Um, our president who had said in March that, you know, there are 15 cases and by next week it's gonna go away. And now there's 100 and, almost 136,000 people dead within four months and millions of people unemployed. And uh, on top of that, uh, now um, a lot of the, the uh, bringing to the surface sort of their racial issues that have been long ignored, that I think younger people are beginning to say, you know, we need to change this. 
So <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying is this is not a time to be a bystander in history. So even if you can do something small, like um, support the candidate of your choice, uh, send a check to voter registration and get out the vote groups, uh, participate in your parent teachers association, um, uh, encourage your colleges and universities and, the, and, and your networks to start beginning this conversation. All of that goes to uh, being a change agent in the long run. It takes all of that, uh, the big and the small. So uh, of course, uh, you know, if you, if you can work on, on something very significant and immediate, like um, Anna was talking about, uh, you know, uh, being participant in the marches and, and watching and being a witness, that's certainly uh, one way, but there are many other ways to do it. And so, um, and that's, that's how change happens in this country. I mean, that was the history of the civil rights movement. It didn't all happen on the, on this, in Selma and Montgomery. Uh, it happened big in, in big, small ways in both big cities and small town America. And, and I see that happening with this particular movement. So find a way to get involved. And, and, and if I add two seconds, because I, I think that um, I know we're creeping into the, the witching hour, but I, I would just say that I think law students um, particularly fall victim to a notion that like, when I'm a lawyer, I can be powerful, or when I'm a clerk, I can be powerful, or when I'm, and I'm here to tell you, we have no idea what the practice of law is going to look like in two years. Uh, Judge Chen will probably tell you, we don't know what courts are going to, I mean, everything is changing, not just because of COVID, but because everything is changing. And I think that lawyers are, and law students particularly, are hydroponically raised to be the change that Don is talking about. It doesn't have to happen once there's a JD in your hand. And I think, you know, one good example that I keep telling law students is that most poll workers are 75 years old. They are not gonna be working the polls in November. Law students can absolutely jump into the spaces right now that um, you know, where rickety election systems uh, have, have really become vulnerable. And so I just think write op-eds, write letters to the editor, write to your senator. These are all skills that if you've learned nothing else at law school, it's how to be a devastating writer. So I think it's just, I think it's a tragedy if you are waiting around to be activated because you are hearing the other two panelists say, nobody's going to kind of give you the recipe, but just do it, do it because we need you and do it because thank God, this has been a youth led movement all along. Thank you, Dahlia. And yes, um, we urgently need poll, obser poll observers in Franklin County. I've been one before, so please sign up. Um, and I think ACS Columbus, we are gonna do something with regard to poll observing. So. Um, please do sign up for our emails. I know we're at 632, but there is one really good question, um, you know, that I think would be good for us to uh, think about. Um, and then, then perhaps we can wrap up after that. So the question is, do you have any advice for those seeking a national conversation about reparations for descendants of enslaved people? What was most persuasive to Congress in passing the Reparations Act for Japanese Americans? Maybe I could speak to that. Um, first of all, Japanese Americans were very divided. Uh, and most Japanese Americans who ended up imprisoned were not initially in favor of that movement. They had to be persuaded. And the reason why is after they let out, were let out of the camps, they had to, they were, they had to return to the very communities that exiled them in the first place. And remember, Fred Korematsu lost in the Supreme Court. So the public thought, yeah, there must have been a good reason to round these people up. And so people kept a low profile. They didn't talk about it. And a growing movement starts with an idea that, uh, you know, this is not just about money. This is to make sure it never happens again to anybody else. And so uh, the genius of that was Daniel Inoa and um, uh, Norman Mineta and a few other uh, key Congress people uh, pushed for a commission uh, to study the uh, impact of the Japanese American incarceration and its causes and effects. And they then held uh, uh, 
hearings in every major city in America. And uh, suddenly Japanese Americans heard their fellow uh, people in the community testify what they've gone through. And some of that uh, footage, uh, news footage was just heartbreaking. It just was rendering. Uh, and, and I know for my parents, they didn't talk about uh, the, the incarceration uh, much, but once it, uh, it was okay to, to raise these issues, a lot of outpouring uh, came out. And I would say, uh, again, it's not my place to, uh, to make recommendations for the African American community or anything like that. I don't want to speak out of turn. But I think there is something to be said about um, generational trauma. You know, we, we know that generational wealth is passed from one generation to the next. Just ask Donald Trump. We, we also know generational poverty is passed on from one generation to the next, but so too generational trauma. And um, I think that's part of the reason why the playing field is not level. And uh, there's been much talk uh, over the past 20, 30 years about race conscious remedies. Uh, I think it's time for that conversation to again uh, start again. And so, um, uh, whatever label you give it, whether it's uh, reparations or um, affirmative action or um, uh, war on poverty and when we were growing up, uh, something has to be done here because the income inequality gap and it's based on race, COVID-19 is exposing all of that. I mean, black and brown communities are dying at a rate that's three and four times more than other communities. That's a stunning statistic. And so uh, it requires uh, some really uh, strong uh, remedies. So I think that the question is really well put. And I think it's time for to have that conversation. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that question before I wind down this evening? Okay, a um, couple of comments from uh, Subodh Chandra and Katie Shanahan. Um, they just want us to know, you know, there's a difference between poll workers and poll observers and poll workers are what is most necessary. Um, and, you know, they, they really want to encourage people who can sign up to be poll workers today um, to do so. Um, and then um, an anonymous uh, comment, thank you to each of you for doing this. You're all very inspiring and I want to echo that. Thank you so much for taking time out and um, you know, joining us, Dahlia, Don, Judd Chen. This has been a delight. Um, I also want to give um, a quick shout out to um, our mysterious host operator who doesn't have his video turned on. That is Vincent Ang. Uh, Vincent is um, has this amazing government affairs um, agency and he does a lot of work that um, affect the Asian community. So look him up. Um, he's also affiliated with stopreveatinghistory.org, um, which is an organization that kind of um, makes sure that Korematsu um, is alive and well in our collective history. And so we don't repeat those mistakes again. So feel free um, to check out that website. It, it is a nonprofit. So donations welcome um, and thank you so much for joining us uh, please do email me or ACS Columbus with questions and if there are any last thoughts that any of you have please go ahead thank you so much Anna thank you Dahlia Judge Chan always a pleasure and we really appreciate everybody who tuned in you're thank here you. thank you take good care wash your hands <laughs> thank you everyone have a thank great you. evening Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.